How do poverty, geography, and social status affect one's right to breathe? In December 2020, the New York Times published an article following two children in Delhi and measuring the quality of the air they breathed throughout the day. Meenakshi Kushwaha, aid volunteer who went on to become an environmental health researcher with ILK Labs, led the team that did the study on which the article was based. Shweta Narayan, environmental health activist and aid grassroots partner with Community Environmental Monitoring and Healthcare Without Harm, has worked with communities throughout India in monitoring pollution, educating health officials, and advocating for change. They spoke in a panel moderated by Sridhar Vedachalam, aid volunteer and director of water at the Environmental Policy Innovation Center in Washington, D.C. Truly an honor for me to be here on this panel. Uh, like Sridhar said, he recruited me in 8 Columbus. And I think my first meeting when I came to, uh, my first meeting was in fall 2009. And uh, it, it was Shweta's, like, Sipkot Kadlur project is the first one that I learned about. Um, so, you know, it's, this is just truly an honor to be here on the panel. Um, so I will first start with the New York Times article. I'll share my screen and I'll just walk you through the article uh, to cover what we did and talk about some of the behind the scenes work, like how did we actually do this stuff? So this article was published uh, one month back around December 17th. Um, and, uh, but we actually did this work one uh, one year ago, like December 15th, I think the first week of December 2019. And then COVID happened and the reporters got busy with their reporting on COVID and elections. And uh, we didn't know if this article will be published at all. Uh, but then I think the conversations of uh, COVID and air quality started when, you know, winter smog in Delhi happened. So they thought this will be a good time to bring this back to the table and work on it. Um, so in this article, um, the goal was, and this was New York Times idea, the goal was to compare the exposures of uh, children living in different uh, like poor households, rich households, follow them for a 24 hours time period, and then see uh, if the difference in their living circumstances actually reflects in their exposure. And to make a story which is like a multimedia story that captures, uh, that has the numbers, that has videos, and it's more relatable. Um, so the two kids are Monu and Amya. Um, Monu is from a poor household, Amya is from a, like a upper class, upper middle class family. And, uh, and we followed them for about um, 16, 16 hours in a day. So the story starts with, you know, following their day. So, you know, when they are waking up, as they go through their activities of the day, how their exposures compare. So on the left side is Monu's, uh, will be Monu's footage on the right side is Amya's footage. So even just waking up and this, these bars, the orange and yellow bars, they are their um, exposures, um, like what they are breathing in real time as we measured with our instruments. So even, you know, just starting their day, Monu, Monu's, uh, um, Monu is breathing like eight times worse air than Amya. And uh, this is, Monu actually lives in a uh, hut in a slum. And this is Amya's neighborhood. I think this is Greater Kalash. Um, okay. And again, you know, they are getting ready for the school. You can see that their exposures here compared. Um, and this is, so we measured uh, air quality or we measured the particulate matter, the PM 2.5 that you may have heard a lot in the news about. Um, those are particles that are less than 2.5 micron size and can go in to our lungs like really deep. Um, so we measured them in different ways. Uh, we took different instruments and I'll talk about that. Um, and one of them collects the 
um, particles on a filter and even without seeing the numbers, just looking at the filters, you can see this is the particle deposition. This is how much particles Monu is breathing and this is what Amya is breathing. So these are the filters from the instruments where air flows and the particles deposit. Um, we could tell that there was a big difference. And now this chart shows how their exposure looked throughout the day. Um, so uh, Amya is, Amya's exposure is in yellow here. So, um, and it was mostly, it was high, but much lower than um, Monu's. And there were interruptions, like there are these patterns when she goes out, but whenever that she is indoor in her school or in her house, um, she goes to a school which costs $6,000 a year. It has several purifiers. Every class has a air purifier and it is well sealed. So all her indoor um, exposure is much less as compared to when she is outdoors. And in her house also, in her room, there are like three purifiers. Um, Monu's exposure, you can see it's, it's an orange. Um, and he his day is like, the, his exposure changes from high to low, but it is consistently much higher than what Amya is breathing. Um, this is in the beginning, um, like early morning, as we saw when they were waking up and getting ready for school. This is them going to the school. Uh, so Monu on a bike, dusty roads, and Amya inside a car with air conditioning on. These are the different schools. This is Amya's school. Uh, I think it's RD, R RD school. Um, and it's like one of the best schools in the city, we were told. And this is Monu's school. This is under a metro bridge and there is no indoors his the indoor is outdoor for him there's just it's like a they all students sit under the bridge for the school um this is a air filtration system in the basement of amia school so you know they are they are equipped to handle the air pollution and this is as they are sitting in the class this is amia's class you can see her exposures like 20 units and Monos is almost 100. Um, uh, Monos exposure does go down during the day when he's in school because as a, um, because at home there are wood fires at his home and his neighborhood to cook. There is no LPG. Um, so this is more footage in the school. This is they're having lunch. Um, during midday, as they're having lunch, as traffic decreases, uh, the exposure also decreases. But still, you can see that there is a difference. Around 30 for Amya and around 70 for Monu. And this is end of the day. They are home. Um, again, and working on their homeworks. Um, and in the evenings, there is more cooking in uh, Mono's neighborhood from, so again, wood fires and winter. So there is wood is used also for heating. Um, and then for Amya, the cooking, the cooking does uh, create more particles. So there's higher pollution, but um, cooking is happening. Someone else is doing it in a separate room, in a separate kitchen. Um, in her house. And this is Monu's mom cooking. And so once again, we see similar patterns as we see in the morning. Um, yeah, so that's, and this is Monu's mom and this is Amya's mom. mom. Um, Monu's mom uh, talks about how air pollution is not something she worries about because she's worry, worrying about where the next meal comes from. Um, Amya, Amya's mom does care about air quality because Amya has asthma. So, um, and this is them sleeping. So, once again, Amya's exposure is quite high right now, and 
again, Mono's exposure is much higher. Like it's just dangerous, really dangerous levels. What the article, like the a bottom line of the article, the or this work was that um, if you're richer, if you have air, uh, you have purifiers, you can protect yourself from the air pollution in Delhi or a city like that, but only to a certain extent. Even with purifiers, Amya was breathing 100, uh, uh, you know, 100 units of PM 2.5, which is way higher than what WHO calls safe, which is like 10 units and what Indian air quality safe standards are, which is like 40 units. Um, so, you know, being rich protects you to some extent. And just to highlight the, you know, again, the inequality, even, you know, just like as this is being uncovered and, and people have talked about for a long time, like even in air quality, um, the poor are breathing worse than the rich. And so the uh, so New York Times team they wanted to make a or wanted to write a story which is which has impact and uses this different kind of multimedia to make this story more relatable. So they actually contacted our um, collaborators in US and then they said you know hey there is this team in Bangalore. So actually my team is in Bangalore and we were working in Bangalore then and uh, they can they can do this. Why don't you talk to them? And so we suggested, hey, we are in Bangalore, let's do this here uh, because this, this is a lot of equipment. This is all doable, we can do it here. But they wanted to work in Delhi because you know, people will care more if the story is from Delhi. So what that meant is that we had to pack all our equipment and then take it to Delhi, which we had not done before. So our packing list for this was like, 40, like, I think we had 40 plus things that we had to take instruments, um, instruments, accessories, uh, and just everything. Um, so we did that, me and my colleague Aditi, we both uh, went to Delhi. And this is in our hotel room. This is, these are some of the instruments that we used. Uh, this is one day before. Um, so the way we work is, uh, like uh, my team works is we have uh, we measure air quality in different ways. We have um, sensors on on rooftops and houses and offices, and then sensors on roads. So like half a day driving on roads. Um, but this was personal exposure. We had one shot. Like we had one shot. There are these two families. They had agreed to this really intrusive process uh, that you know we have. We will spot says hello. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, this re this is really intrusive personal exposure. Like we had we were we had to follow the kids um, with all these instruments, and not just that. Like as such, personal monitoring is quite intrusive. Not just that. Uh, they were also going to be uh, photos and like video cameras and all of this. So um, this was the New York teams and uh, New York uh, Times team in Delhi that they uh, talked to kids and finally found families that were uh, open to this. Um, and we were told, and, and this, this is what it was, that we have a 24 hours period. We have to get everything right. We could possibly go back again, but at any time the school may say, you know, hey, we have, we have had it. You came here once, we are not going to come here again because we're going to the classroom, we're going to the canteen, we're just going everywhere. And Mono's family, Mono's family is like, you know, attracting so much attention that like, why are these video cameras coming here and why are these people following you? So we get one shot. We get one shot, we follow the kids from, like we have to be there before they wake up and until they sleep. So I think that was about 16 hours. So this is basically one day before in the hotel, we are charging everything. And we, take, we took all of this. Um, um, and there we are measuring like these particles three different ways. So it's like there are three different um, reasons and also kind of like backup of backup. If something fails, uh, you should have a backup. And if that fails, you should have a backup. And we were both... Um, we followed the kids on the same day. So me and my colleague, we split. And for the New York Times also, there were two parallel teams of videographers and photographers. 
and we were following the kids on the same time and the two different parts of the cities and constantly exchanging notes new york times had already decided what kind of panel they want so you know the panels that you see um they getting they waking up they getting ready they're having their lunch and they had like a longer list and they saw they thought what is possible and some people in new york were awake while we were doing this in uh, india to compare like the final panels that we saw for editorial approval like okay do we need to they do they need to take the shot again and our job was and like to make sure that while they are taking the videos our instruments the real time instruments are working which is are these blue big like lunch big lunch boxes that you see on the left side and then all the smaller instruments are also working for continuous exposure so there was a lot of diy stuff um if you can see um on the blue um blue boxes there are like something called plastic uh, uh, there are two rubber bands and then there is a plastic cover so these instruments are touch screen and uh, they were inside our backpacks so in this panel um uh in this photo in the right hand side um bottom right hand side corner you can see a purple bag those instruments were in this bag and there is a tube sticking out of it there are two tubes actually sticking out of it sucking the air in and the measurement is happening in inside so by mistake as we are carrying it around uh the touch screen should not be pressed so that's why we have like a plastic cover from a to go box there um and these are just backpacks regular backpacks in which we cut holes for the and this is a very common method of doing measurements and then there were just um foam pads inside for cushioning so that the instruments are safe they are not really designed for uh this on the go monitoring they are better like, like uh, they do better when they sit at one place but this was just like uh improvising that happens a lot of time when you're doing personal monitoring so this is a tip, this is like a typical scene from that day this is amya's school and on the left you can see amya is having lunch with her um, but he's uh, it was amazing how the amya or mono they were not camera conscious so that was pretty cool and that helped um and the camera and the cameraman is there and our instruments are here um when they were walking we were just walking with our um instruments behind them so our job was to stay uh stay hidden but make sure that our instruments are working and they're measuring um continuously uh, okay so this was measurement day uh, this is um on the same measurement day on the left hand uh, side um this is amya's bedroom we didn't take all these setting photos in monu's house because it was as it is there was just limited space and um we were just already intruding too much but amya's family was more comfortable they were pretty chill and kind of excited about this so uh, we were able to take more photos here um so this is the setting on uh, on the wall the white thing and then there are two more things uh, there is a battery backup with that and there are two instruments they are hanging just right above her bed to measure uh, her exposure while she is sleeping um and on the right uh, are the again the closer look up of the two backpacks that had all the instruments okay and then there was stuff like this so this is uh, you saw the footage of the car uh, as amya is driving to the school so this is um the cameraman you know trying to not fall out of the back of the car and someone is holding his collar so he stays put um that's karan uh, um and then so we were in delhi for a week um one for the possibility that either we may have to do this two three times if we get a chance um and then the other thing is to calibrate our instruments so all the instruments that we took in our backpacks they are not collecting there is no particle counter in that you know that is collecting uh you know 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 particles that are entering the air all the measurements happen by proxy by uh, what i mean is that um in the instruments there is light scatters based on how many particles are entering and that light scatter is uh, changed into an electric signal and that gives you the number so because all these instruments are collecting data by proxy these are these are called lower cost instruments or consumer grade instruments we have to calibrate them 
so that when we see a value of 20 in this instrument, we actually know whether this is 20 or 40 or you know something else. So the way calibration happens is um, that we put it, we put our instruments next to a reference grade instrument, which is not portable. And that's why it's fixed at one place and it's more expensive and then derive a relationship between what my instrument is measuring and what the reference grade is. Uh, instrument is what uh, measuring. If you've worked in a lab, if you work with instruments, you know what calibration um, is, but this is just in case it's new. So on the left-hand side, that big uh, um, thing uh, on this ugly rooftop, that is the BAM, which is like the reference grade, grade instrument. Um, it's quite expensive, um, but we, our uh, collaborator had installed one BAM few years ago in the Fulbright house or the, uh, the Fulbright scholarship house in Delhi. Um, the Indian government has these bands, but we will not get access to those to um, calibrate our instruments. So we had uh, access to this instrument in Delhi. Um, so we wanted to calibrate our instruments after this. Um, I'm so sorry. Spot is excited about the talk. <laughs> Um, and, and so the rest of the day, uh, the rest of the week, we, we spent uh, calibrating our instruments against this BAM um, in that um, building. Um, so ideally, when you are conducting such an experiment, calibration will happen before, much, much before. Um, and you will probably want to do it for months or weeks or a longer time. Um, and we had some data from we had some data from before, but since we were in Delhi, we just wanted to do this again to make sure what our instruments are measuring, what the, they are telling is the correct val value. Um, and in the middle, you see that white strip with the black uh, circles. That's um, in the reference gear instrument. Uh, there is a tape, and it keeps rolling as the air keeps depositing. And this is just like, again, like this is just so black in Delhi. If you, you have this instrument, uh, if you have a BAM in uh, North America or probably where you, you are staying, this will look gray. Like it is, this is just, it's just too black. Um, so this is just like, again, another metric to show how, how polluted the air is. So that's what we did the rest of the week. So we used some of this data, some of the data that we had collected earlier from a previous year and then calibrated or um, corrected our values to give the final numbers that you see in the article. And if you go in the details uh, on the methods, they talk, uh, just what I described, they talk about that. So overall, this was a great experience, learned a lot about communicating messing data, uh, mess messy data to public, uh, like how to communicate that. And, you know, usually we are just working in our bubble, in our lab and in our or in our office or just like within our research groups where they know what we are talking about. Um, but this was, uh, this was certainly a different experience. And also for a 24 hour measurement campaign, I think the time that we spent from the preparation to finally like um, data analysis and uh, the final product, it took um, two people full time, like one month of work over the one year to do that. So that was also a good lesson, like how a small project, like how to prepare for small, seemingly small projects like that. Um, yeah, That's, uh, I'm open to questions. I don't know if we are doing that now or later. Thank you, Minakshi. Maybe we'll do Shweta uh, talk, give her talk and, and there's a movie and then we'll come back to questions. There, there are lots of questions. I'm, I'm sure uh, I have some. Uh, so Shweta, are you able to present now? Sure, yes. Um, just a quick hello. Uh, I'm going to turn off my video soon because I don't have good bandwidth. But hi, everyone. And um, yeah, I just mess messaged in the chat that what a full circle we have from Columbus to, I mean, from aid to Columbus to Seattle to back today after so many years. And yeah, uh, Arvinda, you're right. I mean, it's okay to be be the mafia once a aid forever and <laughs> uh, so yeah um uh, uh, i mean actually great article great stuff and and uh, of course i had imagined that there would be 
a lot of groundwork that had gone in that uh, piece uh, but yes um quite intense uh, we uh, um, as as a group and uh, working with communities we do uh, monitoring but uh, not as uh, high grade gold standard stuff i mean it's gold standard but not as technical as uh, what you just explained uh, ours is more of like low cost or no cost uh, but um, enough to generate evidence enough to uh, question the 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 top down uh, science that sometimes uh, pollution control boards and government impose on us basically saying that there's no problem um so yes uh, it's 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 been quite a uh, quite a uh, quite an experience uh, generating the data and generating the narratives that we have been able to do over over a period of time um to me what what appealed in this piece and 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 some questions that came forward which i wanted to kind of discuss here was i mean the the equity uh, issue is is absolutely important and uh, within the city i mean one uh, uh, though we talked about uh, a privileged and not so privileged families in delhi and what their exposure is but if you look at the narrative in india and if i were to ext- extrapolate from that delhi still gets a lot of mileage in terms of air pollution but other cities don't and um, and and now when we are also talking about solutions a lot of solutions that are non solutions to start with like the smog tower uh it's been talked about in delhi but in general when we talk to talk about solutions to air pollution we are perpetuating that inequity uh by imposing certain solutions that would become problems for other cities and my my favorite example and it could be controversial and but i'm just putting it out here is the whole solution of evs where um electric vehicles for uh, policies are being written for big cities like delhi or bangalore or chennai but uh, there is no question being raised about where this electricity is going to come from and if that electricity is coming from coal you may be cleaning up your streets in delhi by clean transport but you're exporting that pollution and inequity on an already burdened community um, either in chhattisgarh or in north chennai which is experiencing the 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 problems of of coal pollution um, already right so um uh, i think uh, uh, the the potential of uh, I, again uh, till now this kind of uh, this kind of a uh, 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 narrative was not really out there so new york times putting it out there makes a big difference and uh, uh, i think now is the time when we kind of uh, reflect upon it and extend this whole issue of equity in problem and in solution in a larger framework in a larger um, in a larger community to sort of bring everybody to board on board and say that you know we are all um, um uh, affected by the problem and uh, and and we need to be conscious of what solutions we are propo- uh, proposing i think that's that's the the crux of the message that i would like to um uh, reflect upon today what i have uh, right now in fact um i have a short video we had prepared we have um um uh, we've been working very closely with communities in uh, central india in chhattisgarh uh, which are coal affected uh, but uh, that's been an interesting experience because not not only are we working with communities um for the first time we've also started working with health policy makers and uh, sort of looking at air pollution as a health problem and um, not just um, uh, uh, just reflecting on the health problem but uh, what can health policy or what can health experts how can they in providing solutions um so um uh, my computer just reminded me that my internet is unstable so i'm just turning off the video um so uh, uh we've been working with a health policy uh, group in chhattisgarh uh, which is called the state health resource center in sort of uh, reframing the whole problem of i mean uh, air pollution is a health problem is something that all of us know about it but then from a uh, from a solutions lens how do you uh, bring about a positive change or mitigate the impacts on the health of people and as government what kind of um, 
uh, uh, what kind of uh, policy should be put in place that in the long term uh, advocates for um, you know better solutions and better health services for communities that i'm so recognizing that communities have been affected because of air pollution and then providing better solutions and better health services so um, so we actually uh, uh, we had planned to make two documentaries short documentaries uh, from our work in Chhattisgarh, uh, but then COVID happened and we couldn't travel and stuff. And then uh, finally, um, we uh, because of the um, uh, uh, relaxation and travel restrictions, we managed to make documentaries and we have two documentaries actually. Uh, but today I wanted to show one, which I felt um, kind of uh, gave a narrative of what pollution impacted communities and what we call a sacrifice zones for, for, for development in this country looks like. And that's a story from Korba. It's a narrative, uh, I mean, uh, of, a, of a Mitanin, a community health worker, what she sees in her work. So a Mitanin's role is primarily in maternal and child uh, care in the community and providing assistance to the community uh, like uh, members especially women, pregnant women, uh, escorting them to the hospital, making sure that they have like all their vaccinations done. So, the, you know, this, this uh, uh, sort of partner through the pregnancy to make sure that the, um, you know, um, uh, maternal care is provided and the basic child care is provided when the child is born. Now, um, from her experience of working in Korba, which is a coal capital uh, for central India, it's a power capital. Uh, it has uh, more than 6,000 megawatts of coal-fired thermal power plant. It has some of the largest coal mines in Asia. Uh, what is what, what is her day-to-day -day experience when it comes to air pollution? And so she's she's narrating narrating that, but she's also talking about uh, and that's the unique bit is that how she's intervening in community uh, care uh, with respect to air pollution, and that's the intervention that we are sort of designing with the State Health Resource Center in training methanins, in training the first responders, uh, the frontline workers, are people aware, and they can talk about alternatives, and they can talk about, um, you know, not just uh, protecting yourself, but, you know, uh, what the, what the um, solutions could be. Um, a lot of it does not come out in the film because we just started work and, you know, we were coordinating remotely for the shooting, but I still feel it's an important, like it's a six minute documentary. So I would uh, request uh, um, uh, Arvinda or uh, Vimla to share the screen. And, and, and my request is that this is still, this is still not the final cut. This is, yeah. Um, this was sort of some um, uh, kind of a documentation of, uh, what 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 currently is happening and what we aspire to do, um, starting with one state, uh, one state that is quite polluted uh, because of its mines and mineral based uh, industry and economy. But hopefully, um, uh, it would uh, uh, it would be something that again becomes a model for the country and uh, in the space of health policy and health intervention. Um, uh, there are certain con concrete actions that we take uh, based on um, uh, based on uh, uh, you know what our ground experiences have been. Um, um, in fact, the Mitanin program itself, uh, 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 something that started in Chhattisgarh in two thousand one, and eventually the National um, ASHA, the, the Community Health Workers Program. Uh, which the National Health Mission kind of incorporated, um, took a lot of the, uh, the learnings and, and modeled it around the Mitanin program for the rest of the country. And again, uh, in the space of air pollution and health and community health intervention, uh, this is the first of its kind that's happening in the country right now. And uh, so that's, that's another, uh, I mean, so that's why we are hoping that this sort of inspires other states and, and, and the national government to incorporate it in their policy. Because one thing that we're seeing a lot in the discussion and debate around air pollution in India is uh, there's a lot of um, technical intervention that is being proposed. Uh, not that, you know, there is, uh, I have anything against the technical intervention, but invariably it, it boils down to more monitoring and more studies. Uh, and, and I mean, the basic fact is that air pollution is hurting us. It's, it's hurting uh, the future of our children, but uh, there's not enough intervention or solutions that are being proposed to tackle the sources. 
so even 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 in in case of delhi when you see um the the intervention around uh, setting up smog towers is sort of an end of pipeline quite expensive and honestly useless solution it's not it's not a solution um what 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 we need to do is look at the sources and and design solutions for the sources so that there is no pollution and um again when we are looking at sources and i i keep saying this that delhi will the delhi will breathe easy the day places like singroli or korba breathes easy because uh, you know we 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 share the common resource air, air you know it's not like it's only delhi's air so uh, uh and and we are not we are in in our solutions in our quest for clean air we are not looking at those spaces in fact we are as i said earlier we are trying to export our pollution to those cities uh, and trying to you know make our cities clean which is not going to happen i mean it's a non starter from the very beginning um uh, even in in places like uh, chennai for that matter um the northern chennai part of uh, uh, the city is uh, the ennor manali stretch is the um, power hub it's it has ports it has power plants it has uh, refineries it has like all the industrial um, the 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 dirty uh, industries and uh, the rest of the city is relatively uh, non i mean does not have that kind of industries and um, when we did a study in 2017 of i mean in fact <laughs> we wanted to do a study uh, highlighting the inequity to show that um, you know north north chennai breeds um, dirty air and uh, places like post garden or boat boat club road these are like these high end posh neighborhoods of chennai in fact post garden is the um, uh, neighborhood where our late chief minister used to stay so um, uh, uh, we 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 did a comparative analysis and our hypothesis was that those areas breathe clean air and not chennai breathe dirty air but uh, to our shore post garden or basnagar to be equally bad and and some of the heavy metals that we uh, tested for in in that study actually told us that the you know the, the heavy metals found in the interiors of the city 30 kilometers from the power plants in north chennai matched or or were potentially sources from fly ash of the power plant so you know it, it was it was a lesson in in terms of like uh, you know air is common and if air is polluted in one place you're likely to get affected even 30 kilometers or 50 kilometers or 100 kilometers away so uh, that was a, that was a that was a good lesson to learn and um, uh, you know that that triggered off a whole debate in the city itself in 2017 as as why we need to have uh, you know a say in the decisions that are being made for places that are beyond our sight uh because you know invariably that will affect us so that was that was a good i mean uh, our hypothesis was of course failed but uh, uh something good turned out and that that required that it brought in more participation of uh city residents in decisions uh, around coal or ports that that were being made in the northern part of the city so that was good i think um uh, initiatives uh, uh that are focusing on air pollution um uh, health problems or just highlighting the pollution need to embed the equity uh, discussion around it need to embed uh, discussions around um, of of places that are not uh, being talked about in media and that's why i i'm sort of my wariness about highlighting delhi comes in i mean of course there are obvious advantages the it's a capital of the country you know uh, all your policy makers parliamentarians and judges live in delhi so yes it it should make an effort i mean make make noise we should make noise and it should uh, get attention but uh, somehow i see in the last 5 6 years of you know talking about air pollution we don't look beyond delhi and and and, and i think that's that's where the some of the key problem is or when we look beyond delhi we are just looking for villains outside delhi like the farmers uh with the stubble burning um unfortunately again uh so uh, i think that that narrative needs to change and and once we acknowledge that this is a problem um like in the story the effort that has been done about uh, affecting different people in different ways and also marginalizing the poor even more i think 
from that understanding can our solutions uh, be uh, equitable and and just otherwise the fight will continue to happen and even if 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 there are solutions that are being proposed at the delhi level will be opposed elsewhere because it's 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 for 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 communities like korba or singroli or or raigarh or north chennai it's a matter of survival it's not a choice and, and and anything more destructive or anything more toxic that is being proposed as a, which is touted as solutions for elsewhere but means a definitive end to their existence will be uh, will be challenged so um, i think uh, uh, we need to be very conscious and 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 for us as um, as uh, 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 researchers and uh, uh, you know people who are intervening at policy level at 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 uh, uh, you know from media perspective or from communication perspective it's important to be conscious of this uh, this reality it's it's ex- extremely important that when we propose solutions or when we back um, ideas uh, uh, we are uh, we are aware of this divide that is out there and um somehow i mean I, i was just going to say this but then mean actually mentioned it in in the final testimony of uh, the two mothers of the children um monu's mom's uh, concern was not air pollution because she was more concerned about where the next meal is going to come from and that's the reality in in most of these marginalized hotspots around the country pollution is killing people is affecting their life everybody recognizes it. it's not like lack of awareness but it's not a priority because you know the industrialization or the developmental model that we have uh, incorporated has 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 benefited from that model of policy makers um Uh, um uh, proposing industries for development of those areas was a uh, promise was that there would be economic development the outcome right now after years of this industrialization that we see is that it has actually capitalized on that marginalization and that divide and further uh, impoverished communities so uh, uh, communities are aware they have a lived experience of of war of of pollution of of a disease but uh somehow it's not a total priority because they they don't have they don't know where the next meal is going to come from and uh it's it's an important uh, uh reminder of what the inequities are on the ground so i'm just going to end there i um, i have a set of slides but i don't think i mean it's it's important because i mean you, you, it can be shared uh, later i mean it's a lot of pictures and some data from the um, from our community experience uh, of air pollution monitoring where we have looked beyond pm 2.5 we have also looked at heavy metals because that kind of indicates the sources of the uh, pollutants um and so um, that can be shared later i think we can go into discussions if that's okay with everybody and with the moderator shri uh as i said i i don't have too much background in air quality but i have experience in water quality um and and water policy and uh i i came across this uh survey which is sort of catnip to both air quality and water quality folks so gallup did a poll around the world asking how many people are satisfied with their water quality and how many people are satisfied with their air quality and just sort of comparing notes so I don't know which planet Meenakshi and Shweta are living in, or even which country, because ninety percent of the people in India are satisfied with their air quality. Ninety. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm seeing Arvinda's eyes like open up and not not go back. <laughs> uh, only sixty-seven percent of the people actually feel the same about water quality, um, which seems to suggest uh, what what Shweta was sort of pointing out. We have sort of localized the problem in some ways. um and and you know the effects are everywhere but we think that it is localized you know it's in chatisgarh or it's in north chennai or it's in you know places far away from where we live um and and so that probably gives uh, you know this sort of skewed perspective that our air quality is okay and we've sort of normalized you know there is dust everywhere there is you know smog everywhere uh, this is the way it is um and and so that uh you know and and you know 90% is like close to uk and new zealand and you know places like that where you would certainly feel like there are air quality if not the best i mean it's definitely 
better than uh, any Indian city. So I, um, <clears throat> and there are sort of parallels between, uh, and the, the survey is also interesting to me because there are lots of parallels between air quality and water quality, uh, quite, quite different in some ways, but, but some of the same concepts, the, the inequities that exist, the, uh, the solutions that are proposed. So I, I would see like air filters, is to air quality what bottled water is to water quality, right? So you can you can live with a poor poor government service or a poor public service, um, and and still end up with slightly better outcomes if you can invest in this private solution, which is uh, cheaper at a at a you know marginal level. So you, a, a bottled water you know for one day or for one month is, is sort of cheap. Uh, for for a household, if you wanted to, I mean, it's expensive for the entire city. If you were, if every person in the city or, or the country was living on that, plus an ecological disaster. But you know, everybody can try to. If you make it cheap enough, you can have that that kind of localized solution. But it's not a solution because it only um, leads to underinvestment in our public systems and and public infrastructure. So so you know, I, I see sort of those parallels. Um, with you know Minakshi and and um, you know both uh, Shweta, you've been you know this this New York Times story and uh, the work that CEM and you know all of your other work is, is showing is the 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 idea of public uh, involvement, not just communicating to the public, but also involving the public in in measurement, in you know understanding and giving them the voice which was the first thing that impressed me about, uh, you know, getting, jumping into an environmental policy area, which was like, I did not know that you could involve people. It always seemed like, you know, some people do it. We just sit and watch, you know, we are just sort of outsiders. Somebody else works for our environment. And so this, this was eye opening many, many years ago that, you know, people who are affected by the problem can be empowered, can, you know, can speak up for their own voices. And, and, you know, it's, you know, the, the whole process is complicated because there, there's technology, there's science, uh, and, and so, so all these complicated, uh, you know, sort of, you know, s stories in there. But the fact that you're able to do that is just so impressive. Um, how do you, um, Shweta, you know, speaking from your experience working on, you know, so many different, so many different locations, and I mean, actually, uh, can you, can you say a little bit about how, uh, how do you get people to, care about or you know work on these things you know not just personally but speaking up on a, on a more you know wider level so you know working with the city working with the government agencies uh, on finding systemic solutions rather than you know finding you know here's an air purifier or here's a bottled water solution for you honestly while my work so far has been um, we have not worked a lot with the people in general as in citizen science as Shweta, Shweta has worked. And it's very challenging to get people to care. So I guess like the um, driving principle is you start um, from a place where they are. And so um, we work with um, C-STEP, uh, which is um, Center for Science, Technology and Energy Policy in Bangalore. They are more involved in the you know, get uh, talking with uh, state officials and um, stuff like that. So I just have like lessons, lessons from them. Um, one thing that we have uh, tried to do at C -step, with C-STEP is that if you have a low cost sensor and you want to make sure that uh, it works well, um, like we can help them evaluate it because C-STEP has an infrastructure of all these high, um, uh, like high um, reference grade instruments. And so that they have that infra infrastructure. Um, it's, um, it is hard. Like the, I, th I think the only uh, Shweta is more, uh, Shweta is more um, mm, well situated to respond to this question because of her just wide level of experience um, when we try to, so we have a network of purple air sensors, which are small PM 2.5 sensors. And uh, we're trying to build a network uh, in the, in Bangalore city, just uh, kind of from academic point of view to see how to maintain, like what, what does it take to maintain a network like that in a city like this? So when we approach households, we just, um, I think um, 
talking to them in a way where they know that they uh, like having this empowers them a little bit like in knowing uh, what they are breathing and if they can do some uh, it's uh, it's just like having that knowledge on what they are breathing how it is changing with time and what is affecting it um that helps like this language of hey here is this, this is a tool which will empower you in small ways um yeah and I'm, i'm looking forward, forward to hear what shweta uh, has to share on that well it's it's not not been easy but it's been uh, interesting um uh, one way of getting people to care is when uh, as, uh, okay so from from a pollution impacted uh, community perspective it's a lot of building that evidence uh that tra- basically uh, their experiences of pollution is translated um uh, into uh, into evidence that can uh, cannot be dismissed without investigation because one thing that we constantly see is when uh, communities complain of pollution the regulatory agencies often dismiss it saying that oh you're disgruntled oh you didn't get a job in the industry so hence you're spe- saying this or hence you're alleging that your water is contaminated or your air is contaminated or your child is falling sick so um uh, from a community perspective it's a lot of building that evidence and and uh, sort of uh, in a way it's uh, indirectly through this also uh, expanding democratic spaces for communities who are marginalized and uh, you know so that they can have a say in the local decision making or or in the shared environmental fate um from uh, not naturally bringing in people to care but you're making people to care is through litigation <laughs> uh, you take this evidence you you hold the violators accountable you go to courts and uh, courts pass uh, i mean uh, used to i mean i don't know it's very uh, it's 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 kind of debatable right now but courts uh, are supposed to pass orders to correct those violations and to hold regulatory agencies accountable and invariably <laughs> you 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 sort of uh, embed the policy that you desire through a court order and force the government to take action uh, whether the government takes action or that's a different process but that's that's one way of uh, just uh, im- implementing the laws right um uh of late we are seeing a lot of interest in the health space uh for people uh, uh health experts to uh, do something about the issue right from raising awareness to um i- intervening at a local policy level so we have doctors doing it there's a network in india called doctors for clean air that we've sort of been uh working with which um uh, has been uh, very active in talking about air pollution at national level and also at local level then we, there are health policy agencies that are open to um uh, you know external uh, 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 interaction with groups like ours or or any others uh, who are interested uh, inherently to sort of uh, resolve the health uh, and especially looking at social determinants of health and um and sort of uh, combining it with their action uh, policy open and uh, been thinking about uh, ways that um uh, that their intervention could make a difference um so uh, yeah it's, it's sort of a diverse uh, set of uh, 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 of stakeholders and a different kind of um uh, one thing that we have seen that does not help is um and especially with citizens groups and that's where my reference to the farmers and uh, you know uh, 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 making them as villains come in is that uh, uh, just accusing a, a, a citizens group of doing something that uh, they don't uh, i mean that are a result of a various uh kind of policies and uh and and uh, uh processes and just sort of making them the villains without owning up to your own responsibility does not work it 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 just creates hostility and um and again um that comes back to the whole issue of uh 
uh, equity and uh, you know how we see and I mean so pitching one group against another does not work basically uh, so uh, that is something that we need to be aware and conscious of uh, while we are uh, designing solutions or designing interventions uh, but uh, just acknowledging the problem and um, the building the evidence be it data, be it uh, health information, be it narratives from the community. It doesn't have to be extensive research, but it could be just a narrative like what the New York Times piece has done. Uh, different forms of communicate uh, evidence and, and, and uh, narratives are important in sort of recognizing that there is a problem. And, and that's where I think a lot of the uh, hurdles are that at this point, the government does not acknowledge. Like, you know, you have a... Um, a Lancet report or a WHO report which says that pollution has killed X number of people in India and immediately you will have the Ministry of Health represented interest trying to malign the global reputation of the country. I mean, that's that's fire uh, in your office or you need to wear a mask or whatever. And you're still saying that it doesn't harm people. It's like just pure denial. So I think acknowledging the problem is the key in finding the solution. Thank, thank you, Shweta. Um, oh. I'll, I'll, I'll let Arvinda take over. Um, I, have to, I have to leave at this point. Uh, the kids are waiting to go to sleep. So oh. thanks so much, Sri, and uh, we we will stay. It's really great to uh, have you, you know, uh, bring your expertise and your long history as an aid volunteer together in a role like this. And we'll have further further needs for <laughs> you to keep yes, participating. Definitely try 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 to try to get. I I I I want to be involved with it as much as possible, but it's just getting harder and harder. But I, I, you know, deep within, I do want to be. No, so. no, we, we understand and it will get easier and easier. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. Thanks, Take everyone. Bye-bye. Good night, Sri. Uh, we're going to move to one more question uh, from Deepa Gupta. And we are probably just, ha I mean, we might have time for one or two more questions before we wind up. So if you want, you can raise your hand or put your question in the chat. Uh, Deepa, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Arvinda. Uh, first of all, thanks to Sweta and Minakshi for excellent presentation. And I think uh, what I sort of love, um, uh, Shweta, uh, particularly your presentation and uh, particularly coming from scientific background, uh, you guys have done an excellent job in putting a, a face to the number and, and a sort of a, a real uh, context to the number because these numbers are there from decades. People know that if we, the participants, uh, the the uh, the pollution levels are high, but the way you guys have has intelligently used the media to bring the awareness, uh, that's really uh, very uh, appreciable. And same thing, I will say, uh, what Minakshi has. Uh, uh, sorry, I think I'm mixing up the names here. Probably I I met Minakshi when I um, <laughs> talk about New York Times things, and and Sweta is also probably doing the similar kind of thing in India in that uh, area. Now, what I, my question is um, uh, for Shweta, actually there are two questions, but first one is more important, I'll say, is that, uh, uh, so I, I'm, not, I'm not much aware of how does the journalism work. However, what I want to know that probably this kind of very intelligent use of media and this kind of exposure is more important uh, to show in a local media in India. So the fact that now, New York Times has this thing, which is good for people like us, who anyway in a good air condition uh, lives. Uh, what is the chances that this work which you have done will be available to people, to the local media in India? And what is the path forward for that? For that? So my question was from Minakshi uh, that, uh, the, yes, New York Times has this very strong messaging media and the, and the documentary or whatever you call it. But it's probably much more impactful it, if the local people in India can see it. And what is the path forward for that? Absolutely. I completely agree with that. Uh, but uh, work like this does need a lot of resources, uh, a lot of people coming together and working in a coordinated way. Um, so actually, someone from Bangalore did contact us and said that they wanted to do something similar in local languages. That has not uh, um, we have uh, not gotten in touch again, but I hope that 
just by this if uh, media houses take initiative they could do that um for us like you know our jo- job as such is just like measurement making sure that what we are doing is um making sure that what you're looking at is accurate uh, but the whole the story the video and everything that does come um that has to be an initiative of a local media company because of all the resources that it needs but i completely okay. but there is no partnership which uh, new york times will be able to, ready to share this this information with the local media free of course i don't think that is on their agenda i like not that i know of okay yeah. so this is basically a okay that's fine yeah, yeah another thing which sort of i i, I wanted to ask probably sorry, already uh, Sorry, I just want to add a couple of things here sure. uh, because um, yes, uh, what New York New York Times has done and brought it to that global uh, space, this narrative is excellent and it was needed. But uh, just to also highlight that there are a lot of local uh, narratives that are being spoken yeah. about. It's just that it's not New York Times level, so it doesn't yeah. get that global attention. Exactly. But yeah. Um, yeah. you know, it's 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 funny when Minakshi mentioned that this all this work was done in 2019. In 2019, um, uh, some of our uh, uh, partners also did a similar exercise in Delhi. tracking uh, the life of four children from home to school and back with a portable um, sensor based monitor and we did a 6 minute documentary and i'm happy to share that if if anybody is interested on uh, uh, you know uh, the 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 exposure and the stories of those children and the aspirations of those children yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, in chennai uh we've been working for uh, a few years now in trying to kind of uh, uh, culminate the narrative of children from fishing community living in north chennai next to the power plants and children from uh, you know uh, uh, richer neighborhoods in besanagar sort of like bringing them together and sharing experience of their lived experience of their uh, environment so this work is happening at a local level it's just that it doesn't get the space that new york times has given the space so that's i think it's sort of a what new york times has done is, is taken this work to a next level of an international level a lot of sense this is this is a lot of the experience on the ground that is being kind of uh, amplified just to sort of uh, i mean it's, it's a complementary voice yeah now i i think shweta you got the the message what i wanted to uh, get to is that truly that's what the meaning of my question was that uh, probably this kind of work is already been done and you already shared with us some of those things however a big, big name like new york times probably can uh, can make much more impact as as you correctly pointed out and that was the meaning of my question also that if we can take same messaging and uh, put to the locals probably things will move slightly easier but but i i completely agree with you and thank you for adding uh, to to the answer well i think um maybe shweta you could take a minute to i mean i think that is one of the key uh, goals for the for the climate health uh, and air monitoring project in chandigarh to get this communication out in the local media so would you like to say a few yeah. words about that yeah in fact my last three slides last two slides from my uh, presentation was about the uh, champ work i mean it's not just i mean uh, we're working very very closely with uh, two health policy and research institutions in chandigarh uh, that is uh, uh, pgi chandigarh uh, post graduate institute of medical education uh, research their school of public health and with the uh, department of environmental studies of punjab university and um, in talking about air pollution and health uh, and uh, sort of focusing on health experts and hospitals as as communicators on air pollution and and through that communication sort of designing solutions um we have a low cost uh, monitors that we have uh, set up which gives daily readings uh, we have um, uh, now uh, um chandigarh uh, professor uh has a slot every morning 7 am slot with the local fm radio where he talks about air pollution he talks about the forecast for the day he talks about what the previous day was like what are the health effects to pe- on people 
and how people can and so this is sort of like the advisory bit and then adding another layer of how people can do their bit in reducing air pollution and how people can organize themselves to demand clean air so it's both so it's it's about uh, you know um, you know you could use sustainable or clean transportation you could, and, and and also the advisories are in a way that if if it's a bad air quality day then of course you need to protect yourself but if it's a good air quality day then use public i mean use public spaces go out exercising in public so use the co benefits of clean air in 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 designing a healthy life so it's it's both Mm, so uh, uh and this is this is all done from a sort of a um uh, health perspective by health experts so it's sort of also bringing in the uh, uh stake of health um uh, uh decision makers in the whole uh, because air pollution largely is seen as an environmental problem i mean we talk about it as a health emergency but we are not seeing health policies designed to deal with this emergency it's still about mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, seen as a environmental issue uh, more than health issue so um, uh, if you look at the slides and i can share a link of so the monitors that we have set up in collaboration in the cham project there six monitors and just looking at that data for last 3 months gives you trends gives you um, a diurnal break up of like when is the good air quality day during the day uh it 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 helps so so you know and we have specific monitors located around schools around hospitals so sort of give give very specific designed advisories for those vulnerable areas so it's 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 the whole um uh, you know uh, uh spectrum of uh, things that uh, that is being uh, put out all so there is research bit there is evidence building and there is communication bit and communication becomes very important because people need to know what's happening you know yeah. it's not enough just to say that we have set up five monitors in your city but if that information is not in public sphere then it's of no use and 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 in chandigarh in chatisgarh i mean uh, in in the in the month of uh, november just before diwali and with this whole covid scare we had the um, chatisgarh uh, health minister uh, launch a state wide um, air pollution um, uh, awareness campaign and the next slide if if uh, in this uh, 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 segment is is all the posters that the government designed or or we helped the government design which talked very specific about impacts on children impacts on pregnant women uh, general impact how do you protect yourself what are the sources you need to know everything and it's just not enough to say okay this is a source and now deal with it but you know what are the basic tips that you can have to protect yourself and and reduce your own exposure but also uh, uh, overall reduce pollution so um and and these these posters i'm told are out there on every bus stands in at 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 in in main uh, junctions in the city in the hospitals so people know when people know about it they will act on it and 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 that's that's something we have learned from covid that even though that now i see a lot of not people not wearing masks in india but there was a point and you know that information and that that um campaign was so high that you know you would call up people and instead of a ring tone you would hear voices telling you about covid uh, protection so you know it, so the government has the capacity to do this kind of uh, awareness uh, uh, initiative take this sort of awareness initiative uh, it's not doing it and we have to make the government do it right right so um yeah thanks and uh we'll you know we we'll try to share um i mean the, a couple of people asked for the presentation so we'll make that available um we are almost out of time but i do want to ask um for a comment from bono sen who is on the call she's a uh, environmental health researcher and aid volunteer in north carolina and so before we close i also just wanted to have a chance to hear from you bono if you can yeah please here yeah. hi everybody um well wonderful presentation from both shweta and minakshi it's uh, so i have been working on air pollution in india for over 5 years now and before that are you that, able to you... put your video on bono yeah sure and before that i actually used to work at epa's air quality uh, office which sets the standards for the US and uh, so you know my experience and i worked at who in india and we worked and i worked mostly on 
specifically in air pollution issues. And I unfortunately do not have a very optimistic uh, take on India's uh, status right now. So for example, you know, uh, Shweta is talking about health and that it's happening now, but in 2016, there was a, um, uh, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare actually appointed uh, uh, a steering committee to look at health impacts of air pollution. And that report has been gathering dust at the ministry. So it is not that they are not aware of it. Um, they are plen there is plenty of awareness at the ministerial level. But last year, you know, when um, air pollution was bad, the health minister comes out and tells people to go eat carrots. That's the situation of policymakers' take on air pollution in India. And I also heard this is, you know, from WHO that there, India is actually right now um, doing a study nationwide to look at the mortality uh, numbers from air pollution. And the health minister told one of my colleagues that the only reason they're doing it is to disprove WHO numbers. So their motivation is highly misplaced. It's not about understanding what is going on in India as far as you know the health outcomes, but they want to disprove. They, so they don't believe in the numbers. And unfortunately, I think articles like you know New York Times that actually do more disservice because it only puts you know the government in India puts their hands up, puts their foot down, and they're like you know. So it's actually it's a very complicated situation. And air pollution, again, you know, individuals can't do anything about it. You know, in Delhi, you, you, uh, people, you tell them to take the metro. That is one way, like public transportation is one intervention that can actually help some of it, not all of it. But people will not. They're very proud to claim that they do not take the metro. And Delhi's metro is one of the best metros in the world. I actually did a study asking people whether they took Metro, if not, why not? And they came up with all kinds of, I thought were not very solid arguments. Like it's safe, it's unsafe. You know, you go in the Metro 10 o'clock in Delhi, there are women traveling. You know, Delhi's Metro is the only Metro which has a women's only uh, compartment. So there are a lot of issues. So people, yes, people can do certain things, which unfortunately they don't. But it's limited, you know, so again, like Shweta's comment on inequity. So India wants to address its air pollution by, uh, you know, getting people to buy LPG stoves. Poor people cannot afford LPG stoves. You cannot clean India's air pollution on the backs of poor people, which is exactly what they did with their Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, is, you know, make them, <laughs> instead of cleaning up, you know, doing other things, they want the poor to change their habits. In fact, it was very interesting. One of the leading world scientists on household air pollution, she gave a talk on household air pollution and you know use of LPG versus uh, cook stoves in India at WHO. And I had lunch with her and she was going to the airport. She was five minutes from the metro station that takes you directly to the airport in 20 minutes versus her one, and, one hour car drive. And Delhi, the, those of you who have traveled on Delhi's airport line know how excellent it is. So she sat there and talked for one and a half hours on how the poor need to change their cooking habits. But she would not take the metro to the airport. She drove instead. So this is, you know, so this is the way, this is how it is done in India. So it's really very difficult. But on the hopeful, on the positive side, I think. One of the things that we need to, I think, can help people take this more seriously. And one of the problems is that, you know, health outcomes are chronic. You know, people react to acute. So COVID is so important and because you know that people are dying, you know. Um, air pollution, it's a long-term health impact and people are not worried. And like Shweta said, they are worried more about putting food on their table. But one of the things I think is that if we change the, we only talk about respiratory issues right now, which are important, but I think because there's so much emphasis on education in India, 
child educational outcomes is where I think we need to shift the focus because everybody, whether it's rich or poor, cares about their children's educational outcomes because that is what is going to, you know, especially for the poor. They spend, you know, if you look at it, they spend a lot of money on tuitions, whether, you know, they have money or not. So education is what they know is going to get them out of the poverty cycle. And air pollution, we don't talk about it in India, has very, you know, is known to cause adverse neurodevelopmental uh, outcomes in children. We, we're beginning to see talk about pregnancy, adverse pregnancy outcomes. But air pollution also results in IQ loss in IQ points, um, drop in educational outcomes, and it is from you know missing school and all. And I think so. There is need to get evidence on that. And I think because the other thing is like for example the Pradhan Mandri Ujwala Yojana, which you know gives LPG stoves to women below poverty line. There's, it's a good program, but again, poor people don't have money to buy. LPGs. And the other issue is, you know, in a patriarchal society, a woman's health is not top priority. But if you put the focus on children, I think the father, the, you know, the nani or dadi in the house, they will be, the thinking is that it will create more um, impetus to change. And maybe people who are now, so for example, household air pollution, you know, there's a, what we call stacking. So they, are, they have an LPG stove, but they don't use it. They still use chula. Now, if, if they know that it's going to affect their children's educational outcomes, maybe there will be motivation to use the chula less and the stove more. You know, so there are, these are certain things I think that we need to, because we've been talking about respiratory health outcomes and, you know, uh, COPD and, all that and it's not moving the needle i think we really need to move the needle and i think education because everybody takes uh, it seriously in india that might help and also i think there is still a lot of um, awareness raising that needs to be done and uh, um, yeah so there, it's a very complicated issue and unless regulations change unless the government really takes so you know there are 101 122 non attainment cities in india which are uh, in the next 5 10 years i think they're supposed to get their act together and clean their air and they are supposed to come up with the action plan to clean their air uh, uh, address their air pollution issues I have spoken to people that are working with the government and they say that these cities, there's one person who has been put in charge of this, um, implementing this action plan. And these people are highly, highly unqualified for to do that. Like they don't even know how to switch on an air quality monitor, let alone monitor anything. So, you know, there's a lot of work still needs to be done before India is going to clean up its air. But I think, you know, um, uh, what aid can do and what Shweta and I mean, Nakshi are doing, raising awareness is great and it needs to be. There need, there's still, I think, and Shweta, correct me if I'm wrong, that I think there's still not demand enough for clean air. No. And I think that, that really, and that is where the citizen science, the citizen involvement is necessary because, you know, we know how, clean, you know, how air got clean in the US, you know, it, it didn't, you know, it was top down, but it was also bottoms up. There's a lot of community mobilization. So, and especially in urban centers, there is not, I mean, Delhi, there's, there's some talk a little bit, you know, here and there, but definitely not the level of demand that will move the government to actually do things. And I get put in my um, chat, the Delhi government is actually doing, we you know, those towers, uh, yes, are kind of a <laughs> bad idea, but they, they are trying to do things. But again, air quality is an air shed issue. It's not just a localized issue. And so that's where the other challenges come in. So, yeah, it's a complex issue, but a lot of work needs to be done, which is great. And aid, you know, we can do that work. So, yeah, that's my take. 
Thanks, Bono. And uh, we, yeah, it is getting quite late. I want to ask uh, Shweta and Minakshi just if they could just make a one minute uh, closing remark each. Thank you so much, Arvinda. Thank you, Shweta. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. I just want to say that I can always, I know I can always count on aid and aid partners to remind us of the bigger picture. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, and so going forward, if uh, there are environmental justice projects and stuff that where I can contribute, you know, I'm, I'm really open and excited for that. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, thanks so much, Meenakshi. We will take you up on that. Shweta. Um, thanks, thanks everyone. And thanks Bono for sort of uh, uh, finishing the big picture narrative from India. It, it is uh, absolutely true what all you mentioned. And I think that um, uh, aid with its um, network of grassroots and citizens based um, programs in India, I think uh, uh, it's our responsibility to focus on justice and equity in, in, in raising the awareness and also in proposing solutions so that, that we should definitely pursue as we go forward. Um, uh, as Bono mentioned, there is a need for awareness. Um, there is a greater need for uh, uh, citizens to be mobilized, evidence that needs to be built from the ground uh, to counter even uh, measures that what, you know, that, that scary uh, picture that Bono just uh, painted that Indian government is pursuing a study just to, for with all the wrong intentions in mind. So I, it, there needs to be a citizen's narrative challenging that because they can, they can fight their ego fight somewhere, but not at the cost of people's health. And, um, uh, and, and so to build that demand, to build that demand for just not just clean air, because it's, 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 uh, it's a matter of uh, life with justice and dignity. It's not just about clean air or clean water. And, and we, we need to uh, put our energies uh, where we know we have the strength to, to build that demand. So uh, I think uh, we, need to, we need to work. There's a lot of work for 2021 and beyond. Very true. And um, yeah, so to the volunteers who are still with us, it's, uh, you know, trying to accommodate all the time zones and, and uh, different, you know, children's bedtimes, we, you know, see that had to leave um, partway through. Um, but I just, you know, I can't uh, leave without mention, like air pollution, you know, just exemplifies the, the, you know, the kind of problem for which aid the interconnected approach of aid uh, is, is very necessary. We talk about interconnected problems, interconnected solutions already with um, you know, the video that Shweta shared showing the connection between the energy sources, the pollution and the health, bringing all these three things together and, and, and the collaboration between uh, you know, what started from an NGO program, the Mitanin, which now has been, you know, taken up by the government. So that kind of collaboration aid and the, and the grassroots partners makes possible. And now with what Bono is adding that we not only, you know, have the tall order of documenting and having evidence to advocate for on the connection between air pollution and health, but also the connection between air pollution and education and linking that back to the energy sources and then putting all of this in a framework of equity and justice and dignity and, and recognizing, recognizing the priorities in, in people's own lives and, and having people be empowered to advocate and demand these solutions. So all of this is what, you know, this is the big picture that aid embraces as we go forward with this. Um, and so, um, yeah, I just wanted to close on that and we will be hearing more about some of these projects and, and contacting all of you who have joined this call. So thank you. Good night. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Bye.